The world knows of unity. In politics, they know that they must be, in their party, they must be united. In sports, they know what it means to be united. In business, they know that without unity there is no success in business. And the churches of today know that their Christian ideals need to be cemented in ecumenism. And that's, they know that ecumenism, unity, is necessary. And then, of course, in warfare, in an army, perfect unity is taught in their um, recruits so that they know that they must be in absolute harmony and absolute unity to win the war. But all these concepts of unity portrayed in these areas fall far short of our unity understanding. Unity in Christ. The representation of this unity comes to us from many different varieties of object lessons that Jesus gives. There is the body, there is the, um, um, yes, the army is given there too in, in the spirit of prophecy, but the one I want to focus upon this morning is John chapter 15 verses 1 to 5 which itemizes the unity in its activity together very effectively John 15 these are the words of Jesus reading there verses 1 through to 5 <coughs> I am the true vine and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Here is the representation of, a, of unity which is to be understood as unity in Christ. Different in principle to the unity that exists out there. And yet there are some similarities. But our focus must be on what Jesus has said here, that the many different branches in the vine are dependent as a branch upon their connection with Jesus. And only and the, while these branches are different branches, different individual branches, yet they are all dependent upon the nourishment that comes from one source, Jesus Christ. And uh, I read it here in the study Bible under John chapter 15, 
verses 1 to 5, identity with Christ is needed. That's Bible Commentary, Volume 5, 1143, paragraph 3 to 6. It says, The branches in the true vine are the believers who are brought into oneness by connection with the vine. The connection of the branches with one another and the, with the vine constitutes them a unity. But this does not mean uniformity in everything. Now this is an extremely important cri identification criteria. It does not mean uniformity in everything. The uniformity, the union, is every different branch in connection with the, with the vine. Unity in diversity is a principle that pervades the whole creation. While there is an individuality and variety in nature, there is a oneness in their diversity. For all things receive their usefulness and beauty from the same source. The great master artist writes his name on all his created works from the loftiest cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop upon the wall. They all declare his handiwork from the lofty mountain and the grand ocean to the tiniest shell upon the seashore. The branches of the vine cannot blend into each other. They are individual, separate. Yet, every branch must be in fellowship with every other if they are united in the same parent stock. They all draw nourishment from the same source. They drink in the same life-giving properties. So each branch of the true vine is separate and distinct. Yet all are bound together in the parent stock. There can be no division. They are all linked together by his will to bear fruit wherever they can find place and opportunity. But in order to do this, the, work, the worker must hide self. He must not give expression to his own mind and will. He is to express the mind and will of Christ. The human family are dependent upon God for life and breath and sustenance. God has designed the web and all are individual threads to compose the pattern. The Creator is one, and He reveals Himself as the great reservoir of all that is essential for each separate life. Christian unity consists in the branches being the being in the same parent stock. The vitalizing power of the center supporting the grafts that have been united to the vine. In thoughts and desires, in words and actions, 
there must be an identity with Christ, a constant partaking of his spiritual life. Faith must increase by exercise. All who live near to God will have a realization of what Jesus is to them and they to Jesus. As communion with God is making its impress upon the soul, the shining out in the countenance as an illuminating light, the steadfast principles of Christ's holy character will be reflected in humanity. I took time to read all that because we are given the picture beautifully here that one branch and the other branch, one might be growing this way and another one that way and another one that way and another one there, down there and they're all going in different directions yet they are united because they are all lodged in the vine. And so there is no room for looking at the other person in this unity and thinking, well, why isn't he doing it in the direction that I'm doing it? There is no room for the slightest judgment upon another person's action in the vine. But there is, there is a united focus upon the one with whom they must be connected. And so it is the degree of our personal union with Christ from which our union with one another can be derived. There was a quote I read that if we are not in unity with each other, we are not in unity with Christ. So if I'm not in unity with, with my brothers and sisters, what am I to concentrate on? To try and be in unity with them? It doesn't work. You try as hard as you like, it doesn't work. Our deliberation must be that if I've got problems with my brothers and sisters to be in unity, I'm a, 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 in a problem state with my personal saviour. That's what it's about. And when I'm truly in tune with my personal saviour, then it will be a natural course of events to be in unity with my brethren and sisters. This union with Christ that we need to concentrate on so that we can be in union with one another is further addressed here in the same Bible commentary quote, Bible volume 5, 1143, paragraph 7, which is under the uh, point 4 there in, the, in your study Bible, detachment as well as attachment. Here it describes the union with Christ. A union with Christ by living faith is enduring. What sort of faith? Living faith. Every other union must perish. Christ first chose us, paying an infinite price for our redemption. And the true believer chooses Christ as first and last and best in everything. But this union costs us something. It is a relation of utter dependence to be entered into by a proud being. How do you feel if you have been used to pridely holding on to your own life, steering and holding the reins of your own life, and all of a sudden you have to give it over 
How do you feel? And it feels so wrong, doesn't it? It makes you feel so vulnerable. I haven't got control over my life anymore. It feels dreadful. And yet, that's exactly what I must do. A union, a relation of utter dependence to be entered into by a proud being. All who form this union must feel their need of the atoning blood of Christ. They must have a change of heart. They must submit their own will to the will of God. There will be a struggle with outward and internal obstacles. There must be a painful work of detachment as well as a work of attachment. Pride, selfishness, vanity, worldliness, sin in all its forms must be overcome if we would enter into a union with Christ. The reason why many find the Christian life so deplorably hard, why they are so fickle, so variable, is they try to attach themselves to Christ without detaching themselves from these cherished idols. So as I said before, if I'm trying to be in unity with each other and I haven't gone into this exercise, then <laughs> pride, selfishness, uh, a fickle mentality will be displayed. We will be fickle with one another. Is this what's happened in the past? <clears throat> so our focus is not upon, oh dear, why aren't we united? Oh dear, why is this happening here and why is that happening there? Nothing of that at all. Don't even think about it. Concentrate on your personal reality with Jesus Christ. Personal reality. Not the other, me. And we saw and heard all that in some degree. So, this is why our theme song was chosen very deliberately. Is your all on the altar? This is to be the theme of our unity. And as it said in the last verse, who can tell all the love he will send from above and how happy our hearts will be made of the fellowship sweet we shall share at his feet when our all on the altar is laid. Is there still something to discover in our unity and fellowship with one another? How much has been laid on the altar and how much is still being held back? Is it entire, an utter surrender, a relation of utter dependence? Are there still struggles with outward and internal obstacles? I don't know whether you've experienced this, there is something that you come up to when the Lord says this way and, he, and you are very much dependent upon your past personal experience of your own life. And to suddenly have to go detach. Oh, what a struggle. But as we saw in the baptism, 
when we are baptized, this is what we are doing. We are saying to God from the heart, I give up everything. Everything I know and everything I don't know. And when the element inside of me comes up with something that I didn't know about myself before and it wants to have create a struggle in submission. Ah, I gave that up when I was baptized. Finish. Instead of, <laughs> I still want to hold on to this. No. If I have truly died with Jesus at baptism, when this element comes up that I haven't been conscious of, it will be dropped, detached, because it has been detached. This is the message of Christ, our righteousness. So is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Recall that the unity of heaven is oriented in the total focus of the hearts of the angels focused upon their Lord. They didn't even regard... They didn't even think there existed such a thing as a law. That's thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, if you remember. I wrote that on, read that on page 109. Service for the angels is not a service of servants. It's a, just a wonderful relationship with their creator. So what happens when agencies of heaven and on earth are so totally focused on individually, personally, on the Lord. Let's read it there in Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 18 and 19. And here Jesus is speaking to Peter and he says, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. But Peter had just said to him, you are the son of God. He said, well you are Peter and yes I am that. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So what happens when all the agencies of heaven and earth are totally wrapped up with Christ? In heaven and in earth, the same thing is done. Sister White writes this in uh, Testimony, Volume 7, 263. Whatever the church does that is in accordance with the directions given in God's word will be ratified in heaven. Because the angels of heaven are listening to the directions of God. The instruments on earth are focusing on their personal Savior and surrendering all. Can you see how what is bound on earth is bound in heaven? It's a beautiful corporate function. And that is what we touched on in the three angels' messages, if you recall. In these last days, Revelation 14, 6 to 12, I saw an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having a message to proclaim to the earth. And what did we read there in Selected Messages, book 2, page 387? Men and women working in harmony with the universe of heaven. 
give these messages. They are on earth. They give messages on earth, but they are messages that are in harmony with the messages that come to them from heaven. The angels of heaven are ministering spirits that minister together with human beings. Isn't that what's written? Hebrews chapter 1. Let's read it there. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he said, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? What are the angels doing? They are ministering for us. And as they minister for us, and we are in tune with the very one that they are connected with, what does that make us with the angels? Is such a thing possible? Is this really the case? That the angels of heaven are working together with us as a complete unit function. Through the beautiful relationship that exists between each individual with Jesus. It's the same relationship as the angels have with Jesus. It's the branches in the vine, including the angels. Is this real? On page 170, paragraph 2 of Our High Calling, just the last sentence of of that paragraph too is so profound. Page 170, our high calling, paragraph 2, it says, Human nature, through Jesus Christ, becomes allied to angels. Yes, even to the great gods. Human nature, through Jesus, as the human makes the complete surrender, as the human becomes engrafted into Christ, we become allied to angels because What are they doing with Christ? They are allied with him. So we are allied with the angels. And we are allied with one another. This is true. Our concluding message this morning is teamwork. How expanded is that team? Here we are, little, a little church in Perth, another church in Brisbane, and then brethren in Port Macquarie and individual members, and now we have another member in France. We're all scattered. Does that matter? This little company is not all that is the team. Perth with its situation, Brisbane with their situation. You know, we become a little bit locked up in our own little cubicle sometimes. We think, well, you know, we're doing the Lord's work. What's Perth doing? Or what's, per- what's Brisbane doing? Uh, oh, they're doing something bigger than we're doing. Oh, dear. Um, uh, and so on and so on and so on. How big is the team?
We had to be a team right across the world, right up with a heavenly team, one team. Everyone with only one thought, to work in harmony. Testimony, Volume 6. Here it is. Follow it very prayerfully as we appreciate this expanded reality. Testimony, Volume 6, reading there on page 456. Four, five, six of Testimony, Volume 6. Paragraph 1. One part of the ministry of heavenly angels is to visit our world and oversee the work of the Lord in the hands of His stewards. <laughs> Don't you love it? Here on earth, God's stewards are doing their work and the angels are there to oversee it. We're a team. It goes on to say, In every time of necessity, they, the angels, minister to those who are co-workers with God, are striving to carry forward His work in the earth. The heavenly intelligences are representing, represented as desiring to look into the plan of redemption and they rejoice whenever any part of God's work prospers. Angels are interested in the spiritual welfare of all who are seeking to restore God's moral image in man. And earth, the earthly family are con to connect with the heavenly family in binding up the wounds and bruises that sin has made. Is that teamwork? I, I love this meditation. Angels are connected with the human family. And the human family, in its work to apply the balm of Gilead, the angels are working in co-partnership with that. Angelic agencies though invisible, are cooperating with visible human agencies. There you have the three angels' messages. The angel flying in the midst of heaven. Preaching. Who's preaching? Man. But the angels are interconnecting. Unseen. Angelic agencies, though invisible, are cooperating with the visible human agencies, forming a relief association with men. What's the name of our church? Historic Advent Sabbath Society. Association. A social society. The angelic, the angels, Angelic agencies are forming a relief association with men, a team. The very angels who, when Satan was seeking the supremacy, fought the battle in heavenly courts and triumphed on the side of God, the very angels who shouted for joy over the creation of our world and its sinless inhabitants, the angels who witnessed the fall of man and his expulsion from his Eden home, 
these very heavenly messengers are most intensely interested to work in union with the fallen, redeemed race for the salvation of human beings perishing in their sins. Remember those angels who loved their Lord so much <coughs> that when Jesus came to the gates, they were interchanging their call. What are they doing with you and me? How intensely interested they are in us. Oh, to broaden our mind's horizon. Oh, to work as a team with these angels and with one another. The very angels who have the knowledge of the experience which we have studied here at this camp. The way God was working to try and bring Lucifer back. The way that the battle took place. They know by experience what we are experiencing. They want to work together with us. Are we going to be men and women who will work in harmony with the universe of heaven? Follow on as it reads. Human agencies, human agencies are the hands of heavenly instrumentalities. For heavenly angels employ human hands in practical ministry. Human agencies as hand helpers are to work out the knowledge and use the facilities of heavenly beings. By uniting with these powers that are omnipotent, we are benefited by their higher education and experience. Thus, as we become partakers of the divine nature and separate selfishness from our lives, special talents for helping one another are granted us. This is heaven's way of administering saving power. Is there not something stimulating and inspiring in this thought? That the human agent stands as the visible instrument to confer the blessings of angelic agencies? As we are thus laborers together with God, the work bears the inscription of the divine. The knowledge and activity of the heavenly workers united with the knowledge and power that are imparted to human agencies bring relief to the oppressed and distressed. Our acts of unselfish ministry make us partakers in the success that results from the relief offered. With what joy heaven looks upon these blended influences. All heaven is watching those agencies that are as the hand to work out the purpose of God in the earth, thus doing the will of God in heaven. Such cooperation accomplishes a work that brings honor and glory and majesty to God. Oh, if all would love as Christ has loved, that perishing men might be saved from ruin, what a change would come to our world. So, as Sister White wrote here, is there not something stimulating and inspiring in this thought? 
I'm overwhelmed, brethren and sisters, with meditation. How humbling is this picture? You and I to be the hands of the angels. And yet we are intelligent beings on our own. And those intelligent beings who can be our counselors because they have experience that we haven't got. And we have experience that they haven't got. <laughs> you know, we sinners, what have we brought from our past into the church? What a baggage we bring with our inherited and cultivated scars. And yet, God will use us as a team with the angels. How imperative it is that all is on the altar. That there be none of that scar tissue exercised. None whatsoever. None of self. Self is the scar tissue of sin. Self is the scar tissue of what we've been brought up while we were in the world. We have been formulated by our parents to develop a certain kind of norm which is totally abnormal to heaven. And we come to the church with all that. We might have received a new heart, but we've still got the scar tissue. And that scar tissue shows up every now and then, and all must be on the altar. Resigned, given up. Here comes another bit of John Teal. Poor, get out of here. I hate him. And you know how it is in the world, they say about their father, my old man. Yeah. My old man came from my father, came from his father. My father's father was an alcoholic. Abject. He died of total alcoholism. And the lineup, the, the, the people know this out there, the, 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 the studies of the genetics. They know that there is an alcoholic gene that passes down. I've got it. And it's extremely extremely vicious each one of us has a baggage from our parents and from the way we were brought up all that must be laid on the altar what a privilege to be the hand workers with the holy angels. What a humbling experience when we think about it. And what were the angels doing? They were just listening to the command of God. A mind willing to do what they're told because they were happy to do it. But we, we've got the scar tissue. So a mind willing, yielded, to be directed down the chain of command. Are we picking up the lesson? How self does not like to be commanded. Just try your children. You command them. Yeah. <coughs> they hate it. So do we. That's self. But when we are surrendered to Jesus, command me, please. I don't know what to do. And if you tell me what to do and I don't like it, that doesn't matter. I do what you want me to do. So what were the lessons by which we are to work? That's the one, first one. Close personal intimacy with Christ recognizing his voice. That's number one. How do we recognize his voice? You remember the theme that we had last year here? The different channels by which God speaks to us? One, the word. Two, nature. God's voice there. 
Three, the voice of the Holy Spirit in the impressions in our heart that must coincide with the word. Four, the preacher, the servant of God, speaking from the pulpit, the voice of Jesus. Five, providence, the voice of providence. Six, the voice of duty. Seven, the voice of the church. Eight, the catastrophes that happen around us, speaking of that. Those are the voices of Jesus that we must listen to personally, individually. Then comes the second point that we learn. That we all are different contributing elements. That one person can only contribute that which God has given them. Another person has something different. And we rely on each other's contributions. We listen to each other. And when somebody shares something that is brought into the discussion, we listen carefully to heed what God is saying. It's sometimes a little bit garbled by human interference, you know, like it is when, when you listen to the a radio wave coming through and you get all the static. That happens with different people speaking in the church too. They're static of the human material. And you've got to listen for the voice of God coming through there. You've got to listen to God and to each other. And we might hear the blessings that God is communicating with us. Contributing elements. And the third one, don't run outside of the sure harmony of heaven. Recall, even the angels had to be commanded not to assist when they wanted to. A, a tall, commanding angel said, "Nah, uh don't help Jesus. No, no, don't help these people in the time of Jacob's trouble. No. None of self. Just do what the commanding angel says. Why do we know that the commanding angel is to be obeyed? Because he's been instructed by the Lord. These are the lessons we need to pick up. And as we are now in these last days, there is an interesting quote as we are trying to battle through the complications of these mad times in which we live. And I, sometimes we don't even realize how mad it is. It's just when you start comparing what it used to be back in Sister White's time to what it is 